let's begin our broad sweep of 2000 years of history. There we are. So we have um, in those nice uh, turquoisey greeny sort of uh, circles, we have a couple of Iron Age farmsteads from about 500 BC, little walled enclosures with uh, round houses in the middle of them. They would have looked something uh, like that. And that is where the first known people out on the fell lived um, two and a half thousand sort of years ago. And um, then if we whiz forward about five, uh, about a thousand years to 500 AD, we have another little depression just there that you can see from this aerial view. And um, that is a Romano-British farmstead from about 500 AD. And it's got more of a fortified affair than the, uh, than the earlier settlements. It's got a protective ditch around it facing to the north. Um, so the people guess that that's probably to keep the nasty Scots out who would uh, come down rampaging and attacking the place. Now, so that's good, 500 BC, 500 AD. When I started researching the fell, I was told that um, around about here, um, where my red line is, there was um, a Roman centurion's grave in a big mound. And I got really excited by that thought because that does act to add to my kind of timeline through history. 500 BC, 40 uh, roundhouses, um, then the Romans in the middle in, the, in their grave, and then the 500 AD um, Iron Age farmsteads. Um, but unfortunately, that isn't quite true. We don't think the Romans really bothered Cockfield Fell even more. But what is in those mounds uh, in where the red line is, is even more exciting. Um, because if you were out living in one of these farmsteady things out on this wild and strange fell, you might easily run out of food, particularly in the days before there was a spa shop on every corner or indeed a blooming Sainsbury's lorry delivering round every street corner. So they built a mound of mud out there and they hollowed out some tunnels, some burrows into the mound of mud and then they lobbed in a load of rabbits, a load of bunnies. Um, there we are, there is an artificial um, rabbit mound, an artificial warren, and so they had meat whenever they needed it, whenever they fancied a little snack, they'd just go out to the pillow mound, put their hands into a burrow and pull out a bunny for tea. This rabbit farming seems to be the first industry to be found on the fell. So that's quite good, really. But of course, rabbit farming is not the industry that the fell is best known for. It is best known for its coal mining. So here we have um, the Iron Age farmstead that I marked out earlier on. Um, you can see the dark line or circle going round it. Um, that's its out, outer, outer wall, outer mound. Um, you can just about make out um, electricity pylon that's growing out of the top of it there. I, I don't think that is from the Iron Age. I think that's a little bit later. Um, but you will also see that uh, particularly to the top of my uh, picture there and down the side, there are all sorts of strange pock marks. Um, and these are indentations. The side of the fell is pockmarked by them like the side of a golf ball blown up. Um, there are at least 400 of these pockmarks all over the fell, and these are the remains from across the last 1,000 years of little coal mines, of little bell pits. Um, indeed, in 1375, the Vavasor family of Cockfield had the Northeast's first inland carbon maritimorum on the fell. That's a deep coal mine. How deep it really was, we don't know. Um, uh, but it was the Northeast's first deep mine, and like all of these pot marks, it would have been worked as a primitive bell pit. There is a primitive bell pit. Now, so to create your bell pit, your miner would dig down a narrow shaft until he reached the coal seam down at the bottom. That's the black bit. And when he 
hit the coal seam, he would widen out his ex excavations, scooping out the coal so that a cross section through his pit looks something like a bell. And I think you can just about see that there. Now, a bell pit miner would stop his excavations when he judged he had gone just as far out, as far wide as he dared before the whole lot fell down in on him. So he would, uh, when he got his mind as much out as possible, he would leap up out of the shaft and start a new shaft um, next door, uh, filling in uh, yesterday's shaft with all the rubbish and rubble that he was digging out of today's shaft. And so that's why um, over time those bell pits have uh, sunk and you get all of those uh, dimples, all of those pock marks all over the fell. And that's the uh, the theory of bell pitting. Anyhow, you get out before the whole lot comes in on you. Um, but as I go tripping and stumbling across the old bell pits on the fell, I always wonder um, how many men were just that little bit too adventurous. We'll just take another couple of tons out, lads. Um, or they were just too lazy, or they were just plain unlucky. And uh, as I trip across the fell, I always wonder down there, down deep down below, how many skeletons there are of men frozen in a pose of pure horror, pure terror, as the sky fell in on them, as the roof fell in on them, and they were entombed down there. There we are. There are um, some little uh, some depressions of yesterday's bell pits that you can see have been filled in and over time they have sunk. Because there must be some skeletons down there somewhere, I reckon, um, because um, the other strange things have been found at the bottom of bell pits. For example, uh, these treasures were not found until 1964 at the bottom of a bell pit when they put the road near the slack um, in. And these little treasures are known as the Buttonal Cauldrons. And they're now in the Bose Museum. And they are four 14th century cooking pots that are well made in bronze and brass. Um, they that were discovered when the road was built at the bottom of a bell pit. They've been untouched there for centuries. What they were doing down there, absolutely no one knows. And as there's no one around from the 14th century to actually go up and ask, we have to make our own stories up, make our own theories up. And um, perhaps a medieval miner fancied a ye oldie worldie cuppy soupy. Um, so he took his cauldrons down there to boil it all up. Um, for uh, and get get some uh, get some nice food going. One of the proper historians who's told me about the film, Niall Hammond, his best explanation is that uh, a local criminal had knocked off the local manor house, nicked all the best um, items, and was legging it across the fell when um, someone spotted him and shouted, "Stop thief! Stop thief!" And he thought, "Oh no, I've got to get rid of this hot booty. I've got to get rid of these cauldrons before I'm caught." And so he looked round for somewhere to to dump them, spotted an old bell pit, dropped them down to the bottom and thought, I'll be back for that tomorrow. Uh, and he never made it back. And uh, there they laid until 1964 when they were discovered. So all sorts of things down the bottom of the bell pit. Um, and here we have a view of the fell um, uh, with a bell pit in operation. Horses must be really, really stupid things um, because um, the way the bell pits were, were, were powered by this extremely rudimentary um, pulley system was that you dangle a carrot in front of the horse's nose and the horse goes, oh, look, a carrot, and it wanders off after the carrot, never quite managing to uh, to get hold of the uh, um, lovely uh, vegetable snack. Um, and uh, as it wanders off after the carrot, um, it pulls the basket of coal up from underground. Uh, once you've emptied your coal out, you go back to your horse, turn it around, plonk the carrot in front of it and goes, oh, look, another carrot. And then it wanders after the carrot, luring the basket back down to the bottom of the bell pit. This picture um, could really have been taken almost uh, uh, any time in the last thousand years, should cameras have been invented a thousand years ago. Um, but it shows the bareness of the fell and it shows that it's in the middle of nowhere. I think this is actually quite a late picture and um, someone has suggested to me it's actually as late as 1955. Um, so, uh, so quite recent really in the, in the great scheme of things. 
Now you remember that I was going to phrenologize the fell with my uh, journalistic friend B helping me, and he's very dismissive of these pits and these pockmarks. Uh, he writes, the uh, outward appearance of Cockfield Fell is very bleak and dreary, and the large collections of rubbish, the remains of once working pits, gives it a still more uninviting aspect. But the air which sweeps this barren hill is exceedingly pure and bracing. Even when I've been up there on a summer's day, a nice warm, balmy summer's day, the air is nearly always exceedingly pure and bracing. This picture also shows the real problem with Cockfield Fell. There's nothing else, almost for as far as the eyes could see. And if you are a bell pit owner, if you're a miner out on the fell, the reason you're digging up this coal um, is not to keep the horse in carrots, but it is to get the coal off to, off to market. And the best thing to do is to get it out to sea um, so you can sail it down to the lucrative markets like London. But Cockfield Fell is largely landlocked and all the coal owners up there could do was load their wares onto incredibly slow pack pony and watch them wobble slowly and uncertainly off into the distance in the hope of finding some market. Now usually the uh, the uh, pack ponies went no further than over the top and then dropped down into Teesdale, something like this. Oh, I, I'm so pleased with that. That, that. It took me hours to work out how to do that. And uh, I think it works absolutely fantastically well. Um, showing my pony going from Buttonall uh, over the top into Eggleston, where there was um, uh, there was uh, lead, uh, lead mining and so there was lead furnaces. Thank you. I've just been brought a cup of tea. That is fantastic. Um, but uh, then, of course, the pack ponies had to come back uh, to the mines, but they would come back empty. And um, anyone who's ever run a lorry from Darlington down to Bristol will know that it's uh, it is twice as expensive to run a lorry um, or it's far better rather to get something to come back from Bristol in your lorry to make it all worthwhile. And so they decided that when they had uh, taken the coal over into Teesdale, they would load up in Teesdale uh, with lead ore and bring it back to um, the Gornless Valley, back towards Cockfield Fell. And so on the edge of the fell at Copley, just there in the 1780s, um, they built a lead smelting mill. Um, even though there is no lead in the uh, Gornless Valley, they were importing the lead from Teesdale for it to be smelted near the source of the, uh, of the coal to overcome those logistical difficulties, to overcome those transport difficulties. And um, the uh, Copley, lead smelting mill is still there. It's a wonderful um, kind of monument to the way they tried to overcome these uh, transport difficulties, the trouble of the, uh, the remote location. And um, apparently the footpaths uh, that the, the pack ponies took um, from Eggleston back uh, towards Copley um, with their panniers full of lead ore, so many silvery pieces of ore must have fallen out and littered the path that they trod, that the path is still known as the steel road because you still got the silvery, silvery bits all over the place. So there we have Copley Lead Smelting Mill uh, on the edge of the fell as a monument to the uh, working around the transport difficulties of the fell. Now underground, the miners were also trying to minimise the uh, the transport difficulties. Um, they had these the drift mines going into the uh, side of the fell, and you can still see several of them. I don't recommend it, but I've tried to force my young son to go down to tell me what it's like down there at some of these mines, but uh, he hasn't got very far, unfortunately. But um, in the 1980s, this Corv Rolly was found in one of the drift mines and uh, going into the side of Cockfield Fell. And this is now in Beamish Museum. Um, the 
one of the curators uh, there um, said that it was a very, very fragile um, thing. And you can imagine that it once had a basket pool, uh, full of coal on top of it, um, and it would have run up and down, in and out of the drift mines. <coughs> Excuse me. The um, curator at the uh, Beamish Museum said, it is little more than a roller skate underneath a shopping basket. It's very, very rare, and one loud sneeze would cause it to fly into a thousand bits. So they try and look after it quite carefully up at Beamish Museum. We can imagine it rolling around under the ground at Cockville Fell in these drifts in these 1790s as the miners tried to overcome the transport difficulties of digging out on the fell. Now, there's an even better monument um, to the transport difficulties out on the fell than even the chimney and even the uh, Raleigh. And um, this is where, in that nice turquoisey green circle there, is where in, uh, it, where in about 1766, a chap called George Dixon uh, decided to build a short stretch of canal. If you've got a good imagination, you will be able to picture the uh, canal there. It's kind of a uh, reedy, uh, but you can see that it's definitely a kind of an oblong sort of a shape. And um, and uh, George dug it out and he built a flat bottom barge uh, and he put it on the water in his little canal there. And then he loaded his um, uh, barge up with bags of coal and he started sailing up and down, up and down. And he was very, very excited by the whole affair. And he dashed off to his uh, landlord, um, the Duke of Cleveland, who lived in Raby Castle. And he said, come and have a look at this. Come and have a look at my stretch of canal <coughs> out on the fell and um, see how I can sail coal up and down, up and down. If you give me about 3.6 million pounds, I can build a stretch of canal from the top of Cockfield Fell down to Winston and um, then I, we can dredge out the River Tees all the way to Stockton and um, from Stockton I can sail my canal, my coal all the way down to London and we can make loads and loads and loads and loads of money. Um, George Dixon was a very sort of entrepreneurial sort of a fellow. He had loads of ideas um, of what to do with his, uh, uh, what, to, what he could do with um, his uh, coal. <coughs> he um, lived in one of the biggest houses in, in Cockfield, Garden House. And um, here he tried to make this the first house to be lit by coal gas. Because um, when he was digging his canal he, on, out on the fell, he also had a little wooden hut. Um, and in the wooden hut, he heated up the, ga uh, the coal so it gave off gas and he collected the gas and he piped the gas all the way from the middle of the fell to his house in Cockfield. Now, they didn't have plastic piping like you do nowadays, so he used um, the stalks of plants, long um, uh, stalks like you get on the, uh, is it the willow herb or whatever it is on, on the riverbank, and he stuck all these uh, pipes, uh, all these stalks of uh, uh, plants together to create a pipeline. And the pipeline went all the way into his house and all the way around the tops of the room. And he put little puncture marks into the, uh, the, the stalks of his plants. So the gas came out and as the gas jet came out, he would light it. And uh, there he would have the first gas jet in uh, in Cockfield. He, his rooms would be lit by gas. Absolutely fantastic. Everyone came from miles around to marvel at the latest wonder of the age, a house lit by gas. Unfortunately, he hadn't worked out yet how to turn the gas off, to turn the light off. Um, so he, at the end of a day of, uh, of uh, doing whatever he was doing by gaslight, he would go up to the flames coming out of these stalks uh, with his flat cough cap and he would bat the flames out. Um, unfortunately, one day as he batted the flame, it didn't go out, it went back into the gas pipe and it went all the way along the pipe all the way um, from the garden house into his little cabin out on Cockfield Fell where it blew the whole cabin sky high and, um, and George realised that coal gas was perhaps not the best thing to do with his uh, 
coal and so he dug his canal got his landlord up and said this could well be the future <coughs> the landlord said just rewind this ridiculous idea about boats and canals and all this sort of stuff um how much money did you want from me 3.6 million quid you must be joking here take 50 pounds and hold a meeting somewhere and see if anybody else is interested in this and so the following year 1767 george dixon called a meeting of like-minded entrepreneurs um, including an edward pease and a banker called jonathan backhouse in post house wind in darlington and from that meeting came a plan to connect oh there's my canal again uh, from that meeting came a plan to connect Cockfield Fell um, to uh, to Winston by a canal or to Stainedrop rather by a canal and uh, Stainedrop will be connected by a canal all the way through to Stockton or uh, the seaport of Stockton and um, I hope you can uh, see uh, the black line at the bottom of this is the River Tees uh, and so the water would come from the River Tees at Winston on the left hand side of the plan uh, the water would go up to stain drop um, uh, where the coal from cockfield would be collected and the canal would wibble and wobble all the way around through the uh, the north end of darlington there you may be able to see the cockerton is marked on the map there and uh, then the canal would go roughly down through uh, Middleton St George, through Fighting Cox, and then up and out to Stockton to join the river at Stockton. In Darlington, even to this day, if you are uh, being foolish, um, people will tell you to go to Cockerton Docks, knowing that it is utterly uh, implausible that Cockerton could ever have any dock, um, because it's just a pathetic trickle of a beck, the, the cocker beck running through it. But it suggests that this uh, this saying goes back to 1767 when it looks like um, the uh, they were planning on having some form of a dock basin at Cockerton as it's marked there on the map. So this really is the beginning of the transport revolution in our area. This, this is what became the Stockton and Darlington Railway. This idea of connecting the coal fields of South Durham with the port at Stockton to export your canal. Um, and this was the first time anyone had ever dreamed of connecting coal fields with the sea. And um, it took them 60 years before they came up with the Stockton and Darlington Railway. And the enormous cost of this plan it was about 3.6 million quid. Um, it sunk the canal plan before it ever got back up and uh, up and running. And so George went back to the fell and uh, carried on with the experiments with gas lighting. And his brother Jeremiah, of course, went off to America to survey the Mason Dixon line, which divided the slave owning states of the south with the free states of the north. Um, George's son, John, um, dreamed up ever more elaborate ways of uh, connecting the top of the fell <coughs> with the river, with the canal. This is an extraordinary Heath Robinson-esque construction of um, showing um, how you can come down the side of the canal with uh, railways and uh, canals and things and baskets automatically splashing off the top of the railway, landing on a barge and sailing on through and all sorts of contraptions to bring the bags back up to the top. This also never left the uh, drawing board, but John Dixon, who uh, created it, he went on to work with uh, George Stevenson um uh, in surveying the stockton and darlington railway in fact this picture is supposed to show john dixon and george stevenson being badly inconvenienced near selby um by the nastily dis nastily dastardly uh, duke of cleveland who you can just see in the right hand corner there the duke of cleveland was wildly viciously terribly against the Stockton and Darlington Railway. And um, uh, my talk on Thursday, which would uh, be great if anybody put to others to turn up for that, is all about his uh, terrible underhand methods. And this is him um, doing one of his underhand methods. He's just accidentally letting loose an enormous, great big fierce bull into the fields where the railway
Norway men, George Stevenson and John Dixon, are trying to do their surveying. Um, and so they have to leg it to escape from the Duke's terrible, terrible ball. And if you look just on the uh, left hand side there, you'll see one of the railwaymen has actually taken a dive over the fence. And you can just see his big Quakery hat tumbling down the embankment. And you can almost hear the big, fat, dastardly duke chortling with joy at this scene. Anyhow, there's John Dixon, uh, my Cockfield man, uh, surveying the Stockton and Darlington Railway. And um, Dixon became Stevenson's surveyor on the uh, on the railway. And probably Dixon did a great deal of uh, of work on the line. So there we have the uh, Stockton and Darlington Railway. Um, at the very top of the map, you will see Witton Park, which is where the uh, Stockton and Darlington Railway opened in 1825. Uh, I'm coming down Etherley Bank uh, into uh, West Auckland, um, where it crosses the uh, River Gornless and goes up number two, which is Brussels and Incline, and then down into Shildon. Um, and um, the whole idea of the railway is to carry coal. So it needs to send its branch lines out into the coal field to bring the coal uh, onto the line so it's got something to transport. And uh, one of the very first branch lines is number four on my map there, um, the Hagalees' branch line, which as you can see, snakes its way from uh, West Auckland um, round Cockfield Fell to where it terminates at the foot of the slack. But originally this pioneering branch line was not going to go to Hagley's, it was not going to go to uh, to Cockfield. Um, it was initially designed to go something like that up to Evenwood, but here where there are, were lots of collieries. But in 1824, a chap called the Reverend William Luke Prattman of the Congregational Church in Barnard Castle married the daughter of Robert Lodge of Buttonhole. And this really was a holy union because the Reverend Pat Prattman already owned shares in the Stockton and Darlington Railway and the new Mrs Prattman was the heiress to the coal bearing farmland at Hagerleases. So most histories say that the vicar was a good munificent sort of holy man, especially generous with his fortunes. But to the directors of the Stockton and Darlington Railway, I think he was anything but generous. He effectively blackmailed them. He said he would vote against everything at their board meeting unless they agreed to turn their line away from Evenwood and curl it around the foot of the fell so it terminated right next to his wife's potential coal mine at Hagerleases. And this does in many ways explain why the world's first branch line should be built to one of the most weirdest out of the way sort of places. And it seems to have been because of the uh, uh, of, of this uh, uh, terrible, irresponsible attitudes or actions of this uh, vicar type fellow. And it worked for him actually. Oh, there's Hagelese's farm. Uh, it worked for him because uh, he very quickly uh, made lots of money. I should perhaps just go back and uh, point out. So the Hagelese's, the line terminates um, uh, at the Hagelese's end um, beside the world's first railway skew bridge. Um, which I didn't know I was going to be talking about here, but, uh, but I obviously am. Um, so the world's first railway skew bridge, this is very, very exciting um, uh, because until this um, point, a, a railway line had, uh, or, or bridges had always been built across natural obstacles like rivers at um, exactly at right angles. But the line that the railway approached the river Gornless was such that they needed to go over at a, an angle. I think it is a 27 degrees across the river. And no one had ever done this before. All previous bridges um, had used keystones in the top of the arch to hold, um, to bear the weight. But because this was going over at a bit of a wonky angle, they couldn't use the uh, keystone. So they used what I call uh, toilet roll technology. Now I'm sure you're all with me on this. You know, when you sit in your bath and you're really rather bored, but you're just soaking there, nothing to do. Um, you grab 
a toilet roll, one of those cardboard tubes, and um, you're just fiddling around with it, and, and you pull it apart, and you notice that it's not um, a, a, a straightforward roll, it is actually um, a continuous weave of uh, rolling the cardboard that when you stretch it out goes on for miles and miles and miles it's an amazing thing and its strength is in the rolling nature of the cardboard and so they designed it so that if you go under the bridge there you look up and you can see that the rolls uh, the, the bricks actually roll round and round and round like an elongated toilet roll tube and that's the power that's where the strength to hold the bridge comes from this this rolling brickwork and they've never done this before and so <clears throat> they built um a model of the uh, of the bridge in wood in the field just next to it and i guess once they built the wooden model they all went and stood on it and jumped up and down on it and when it didn't collapse they said oh that's pretty good this toilet roll technology let's build it in stone and so they did and there is the world's first railway skew bridge at the foot of the Hagleses, <coughs> and it opened with the Hagleses branch line on october the 1st 1830 and so now the reverend luke prattman's wife's farm was connected to the railway age and so he was able to export great quantities of coal and make lots of money and he really did um, his uh, diamond colliery on the bank up into uh, Buttonall um, in 1840 in 1835 he exported 42,000 tons of coal from that um, but uh, unfortunately though the pit ran into expensive geological problems so he took out a loan a mortgage for £20,800 which is about 2.4 million in today's prices and by 1841 his debts had racked up so much that he was declared bankrupt and he slunk out of Barney and settled in Stainedrop where he died in 1846 with debts of £40,000. That's about £3.8 million pounds in today's value which is actually quite a lot of money um, which shows that God does indeed move in mysterious ways perhaps this is payback for blackmailing the Stockton and Darlington railway directors um, <clears throat> but it also shows the gold rush atmosphere of the time on the fell there really was potentially money to be made in them their hills on the fell and um, it is the geology of the fell that makes Hagleses so interesting and so potentially lucrative and also so backward. Now, oh, there we are, 3.8 3 million quid. Um, so let's just return to my map and just look at the uh, geology of the area that makes Cockfield Fell so um, strange. Now, it is separated um, from the uh, plain of the River Tees by a great big hill that rings Shildon, um, rather like my uh, my little green box there. And um, this hill could not be conquered by a steam locomotive like locomotion number one. So the locomotive number one had to park just to the right of my green uh, hill uh, at Brusselton and everything to the left had to be operated by stationary engines or by horses and so um, Hagalese's branch line was a horse powered railway. Um, uh, the, you can see the Brusselton incline there and uh, there's a little picture of it there and on the top of the Brusselton incline they had a, a stationary engine that pulled the coal wagons up one side and lowered them down the hill to the other but all the coal was brought to the foot of the incline by horses pulling wagons that's what Brusselton incline looked like uh, the stationary engine at the top there winding away pulling the uh, pulling the coal wagons up um, and then lowering down the, the other side. It was a wonderfully primitive process. These um, early engines didn't have any brakes, and so um, they uh, so sometimes when the ropes 
uh, broke, you would get a runaway train dashing down the incline, dashing through Shieldon, dashing through Darlington, dashing through Stockton, killing billions of people in its wake. To stop this from happening, um, before they had invented the brake, they uh, employed a large gang of youths to stand about three quarters of the way down Brussels and incline, and they large armed them with tree trunks. And it was the job of the youths to lob the tree trunks onto the tracks uh, to derail the trucks before they dashed down through Shieldon, through a Blade through Darlington, through Stockton, causing mayhem. And I just love the primitiveness of all of that. Anyhow, so there's Brussels and Incline number two there. Everything to the right of it was steam power. Everything to the left of it was horsepower because they couldn't get steam power over that hill. Until in 1856, they built the Shield, oh sorry, 1842, they built the Prince of Wales Tunnel under Shildon, under the hill. Uh, and so now by building the loop line number three, we could get steam engines coming in to Hagalises. And 1856, number three there was built, that line was built. And so this enabled um, steam locomotives to reach the Hagalises branch line, number four there. And so after 25 years of operating in prehistory, pre-steam power using horses, Hagalises was dragged into the 19th century. It was believed to be the last place on the nationwide rail network still to be operated by horses. So this is where my friend B comes into the equation. Before horses were pensioned off, he was sent off by the Darlington and Stockton Times to record what life was really like amongst the pits and the pockmarks, amongst the lumps and bumps of prehistory. So let's join B in a journey back in time around the foot of the horse-powered Cockfield Fell. There you can see um, from this viewpoint the track bed uh, on the smooth grassy plain alongside the uh, Gornless River um, at the foot of Cockfield Fell. B wrote, we take our departure from Shildon in a conveyance, something between an omnibus and an old stagecoach. The proprietor drove two shocking animals and seemed determined not to be any further behind the age than absolutely possible. But going at a quiet pace, there is time to observe the country, which is essentially a coal district. On every hand, are to be steam steam are to be seen steam engines puffing and sobbing as they bring to the surface the results of the labor of those who are toiling below now the slow pace at which our traveling machine was moving gave us time to notice a huge boiler with a large rent in it lying near the road like an ugly monster with his carcass mutilated a day or two before, this boiler had, with a fearful crash, dashed itself out of the engine room where it was fixed and flying over the top of the adjacent buildings like that, pow, it came crashing to the ground without doing any serious injury. So that's all right then. These things can just happen. You can just have a, a boiler blow up, fly over the roof of someone's house and just crash to the ground and no one is worried about that sort of thing. This is the wonderful primitive backwards sort of nature that Cockfield Fell was uh, in the 1850s. Now, my man B tells us that he is riding in a dandy cart. There we are. Um, he says, as it is possible that all may know not know of this kind of locomotive, we will explain that it is an old wagon of a very peculiar description placed on low wheels to render it, in, render it convenient for the horses. So in a dandy cart, the horses pull the train up a hill. When they get to the top, the train stops. The horses are uncoupled and led round to the back of the train where there is the dandy cart. And they sit in the dandy cart as the train goes hurtling down the hill. And when they get to the bottom, the train comes to a stop. The horse is brought from the dandy cart round to the front of it, plugged onto the train and off it goes. An old horse of that peculiar colour, which is nowhere else to be seen and which is formed from a liberal mixture of coal dust and a grey coat, is attached. And away we go up a slight incline at the rate of six or eight hours. 
The road is formed of ordinary sleepers, the way in between being gilled up with spoiled coke, with spoiled coke and it is pounded into dust and coal ashes. The wind is dead in our faces and no small portion of the clouds of black dust which fly up at every step of our ponderous steed is wafted into our faces. There is in consequence a strong temptation to shut our eyes, but the beautiful valley into which we are now entering presents a sight not to be lost at such a trifling sacrifice. So poor B has got all this coal dust being kicked up and it's coming into his faces, but he loves the sight of Cockfield Fell so much that he clears his eyes to see what is going on. He notes how the Haggerleys' branch line is following the course of the River Gornless, and he is very impressed by the horse that is pulling him along. He says our horse had evidently been on the row before and he gave himself to the task with all the energy of one who knew he should ever ride back down again. So the horse was totally knowing that it would get a free trip back down and I guess that's why this horse in a dandy cart on the Stockton Darnton Railway looks so happy with life, just contentedly chomping there because he knows that he puts a bit of effort in, but he gets a good fast free ride home. B says the drivers discard such useless appendages as reins and control the horse to admiration by shouting at the top of their voices. So these horses were controlled like sheepdogs, kind of come by, come by, and they would turn up at the right sort of a place. Now the line as B goes westwards is generally going uphill, which meant that coming down towards him along the line were trains just running away, self-propelling trains running downhill, sweeping uncontrollably around the bends in the line. Um, he says, these wagons can be stopped by a brake, but it takes a little time to work. And as the line is anything but straight, we had to be very careful how we proceeded up the Hagalese's branch line. On one occasion, we waited in a siding and a train of 18 or 20 trucks and wagons swept past us. These chiefly consisted of coal and coke wagons, but one or two which brought up the rear were filled with general merchandise and passengers. And the last three were devoted for the accommodation of the horses, which had hauled the empty wagons up and which seemed to enjoy the ride down again amazingly. There he goes, my happy horse. God, I love that effect and uh, I use it at every conceivable opportunity, I'm sorry. Now, says uh, B, the imminent arrival of one of these runaway trains coming from uh, the west down the line to the east, the imminent arrival of these trains was signaled to us as we wended our way westwards by the men who were at work at the mouths of the pits on the left hand side of the valley and who by their elevated position commanded an extensive view of the road. So you've got all these miners in their bell pits on the left hand side and the high ground there and they can see what is coming up and down the line and so they are waving to B as his train goes along the foot of the valley there and they're warning him that these runaway trains are coming down the line uh, very very fast towards him. I'll be back to this viaduct in a minute. Now, B says, the great altitude of these day drifts um, that the miners are working at, this is very remarkable. And at a distance, the men who are engaged at the mouth of these pits, um, which not infrequently look immediately down into the deep valley below, they seem to be in considerable hazard of their lives. After a ride of about six miles, we rested to e examine a mine which had recently been opened up in the side of the hill. Here, a knight of the pick liberally offered to show us under the mountain for half a guinea. He went to the trouble to remove his pipe from his black mouth and put it into his even blacker hat in order to commence the exploration. But his kind offer was, however, declined for more than one reason. This is almost kind of news of the world journalism, you know, the way they always manage to sneak into the bedroom of the Lady of the Night and the Bishop, but they make their excuses and leave before anything actually happens. This is what B was doing here. I think he was just scared and uh, didn't quite manage to uh, go under the mine, into the mine, into the bowels of the earth. Um, but he had a look at the entrance to the pit. 
he says there's no farming on the fell, but instead more attention is paid to ransacking the bowels of the earth than cultivating its surface. So you have all the bell pits and all the mines, all the drifts up on the fell, and they were connected down the side of the fell to the railway by all manner of trope, tramways, ropeways, inclines and shunts of all sorts of uh, in, 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 unconceivable ingenuity to me. Here you can see uh, the scar left down the side of the fell uh, as one of the lines, the ropeways goes down towards the railway down at the bottom there. And B says, shafts and screens can be seen on all sides and the distant rattle of the coal as it falls from the elevated screens into the wagons below comes sailing on the winds of the wind from all directions. The atmosphere near the mines is impregnated with smoke and the sensation to a stranger is very uncomfortable and choky from the great quantity of black dust which fills the air. That's amazing. The, dust, the air up on Cockerville is full of this choking quantity of black dust. Um, and there you can see another uh, path of another ropeway or tramway or something coming down the side of the fell down to the Hagalese's branch line. Now, says B, um, despite the choky, uh, dusty atmosphere, um, many of the inhabitants uh, uh, of the uh, Cockfield Fell, oh, sorry, there are, the atmosphere near the mines is impregnated with smoke and the sensation to every stranger is very uncomfortable and choky. He's done all that. Um, uh, he, he says, um, despite this, um, many of the inhabitants are remarkably robust and live to a good old age. We can vouch that many of the lads and lasses of the fell look quite charming. Then he goes on to say, oh, the miner in this district is a specimen of the species distinct and peculiar from all other laborers. Uh, he is quiet and harmless and generally civil, mixing with what one class of society, seeing but one round of duties and these dull, plodding and continuous, his life is something of a monotony and his sources of pleasure are few and unvaried. Then he says, he's a little bit snobbish, I think, the intellectual growth of this class of labourers is, as may be imagined, stunted. And he knows of no pleasures beyond his pipe or his pot, or perhaps this Saturday evening lounge in the pub. Notwithstanding the posture in which most of these men work day by day and year by year, from early youth to life's decline, they are for the most part well-built, full-grown fellows, and when occasionally the coat of thick black is washed from the miner's face, a healthy hue emerges, which townsfolk may well envy, and that entails us that he enjoys the best of health. So the miners of Cockfield Fell clearly only have a, a shower kind of once every blue moon, once every year. But when they do clean up, a little bit of deodorant every now and again, go down the uh, pub on a Saturday night, they look pretty healthy despite their mining in these terrible restricted conditions. Not only is my friend B a snob, but he's also a boss's man. He tells his readers that the pits of uh, the fell are happily free from every description of accident. But then he goes on to describe what was very nearly a very nasty accident. A chap called Mr. L tells him that recently the tubs had stopped coming up out of a mine, a drift mine, went under the side of the fell. And so Mr. L goes down the drift to try and find why the tubs of coal have start, stopped coming up. But of course, under the fell, it is all completely pitch black. B says, Mr. L had to pursue his way along the drift mine, which was very narrow. And with the exception of one or two passing places, the spaces was occupied entirely by the rails upon which the tubs ran. He incautiously went without a candle. And when he got about half away up a steep incline of a mile and a half long, he heard the distant rattle of a train of laden tubs coming swiftly down the line to meet him. Being in the dark, 
to wait and search for the inches in the wall would have been inevitably the way to ensure the train of tubs running over him. So without a moment's hesitation, he therefore set off and running at the top of his speed, he arrived at a curve in the line, just in time to escape being dashed to pieces by the train, which word passed him at the same moment. So very dramatic, I think. First of all, I hope you noticed that uh, this drift mine under the fell is at least a mile and a half long. So it must have come out miles away, really. Um, and um, secondly, it's very, very dark. And so, but he manages to get to a curve in the line where he's able to press himself against the, uh, the wall of the, uh, of the drift mine. And he's just able to get out of the way of the runaway train of tubs coming down um, the underground railway line. Oh, little wonder after such drama, B um, has had enough of uh, looking at coal mines, and so he wanders into the village of Cockfield for a bite to eat. He says, this village in its cheerlessness well becomes its sight, but with an appetite sharpened by the mountain air, we here manage to get a better dinner at Mrs. Jackson's house than the place first promised. I hope he got his receipt because when you're a journalist, receipt for meals is always necessary if you're ever going to try and claim back the uh, the cost. Um, and then he went back to the station at Hagalese's and got back into his dandy cart. And now he was able to freewheel <coughs> all the way down into Shildon. He says uh, mixed up with the horses, the passengers, the minerals and the merchandise, we rattled down the incline. Sorry, that's my happy horse again. We rattled down the incline, making few stoppages and being well shaken most of the way. And after a ride of some seven miles, we arrived at the foot of Brusselton Incline. And holding onto a coke wagon, we were drawn a long Irish mile at a good speed up the incline by the stationary engine at the top. If there was not... <sighs> Sorry, I put that in far too much. If there was not quite so much honour, we are inclined to think there was quite as much danger in this ascent as clambering up Mont Blanc. But we landed safely at the top, and after a walk of two miles between walls of coke wagons laden and empty, we arrived at Shildon Station in time to meet the 5.35pm train back to Darlington and back to civilization. So... B's evocative journey back in time to the last primitive horse-drawn part of the, uh, of the country's rail network had come to an end as steam power came to the fell. But little can he, know, have, uh, can he have known the dramatic change that would come within a decade of his visit and would add a stunning new scar to the fell. We'll move on from there. So there, we're back to my aerial view. And um, so now, uh, where are we? About a quarter of the way down from the top, you will see a dramatically straight scar dashing from the right hand side over the dark bit of the, um, uh, of the valley there. Uh -huh. Even got a circle over there and then it heads um, off to the left um, before swerving down um, past my green spot there, which is Cockfield Station. And um, as I'm sure you have all uh, worked out already, this dramatic scar is the new express line um, from Bishop Auckland to Barnard Castle that opened in 1863. Um, it crossed onto the fell where the big uh, turquoisey green circle is there over the lands viaduct um, and uh, the architect of this line was Sir Thomas Bouch the poor fellow who later found a notoriety when in 1879 his Tay Bridge in Scotland collapsed plunging 75 passengers cr and crew to the icy waters of the River Tay and their untimely deaths but on the uh, Bishop to Barney line Bouch designed two stunning bridges. For instance, uh, down at number three, whoops, just over there. So there we've got the line running from Bishop in the top right hand corner um, over Cockfield Fell where numbers one and two are, and then down past number three to Barney in the bottom left hand corner. Um, and um, I think the uh, Bouch Bridge at number three is just absolutely stunning. It is uh, the Langley Dale Viaduct 
which today uh, rises out of the dale like some strange railway related mirage um, adding drama to the natural beauty of the landscape um, it'll be a boring little bit of a daily type view without it really it really does add, add a bit of majesty um, to the whole affair and it is a real shame that you're not legally allowed to get up close to it and you can't use it you can't trample over the top of it um, because it could be doing so much to kind of boost tourism with a with a nice footpath or something over it anyhow um, that's the Langley del Vardar. that is one of Bouch's um, two uh, magnificent uh, uh, viaducts on the Barney to Bishop line and of course the other one is the Lands Viaduct uh, which um, brought the train from the right hand side from Bishop over the top of the River Gorlas, over the Hagalese's branch line, you can see uh, running down the bottom there, and on to the fell and on towards Barnard Castle. So the big powerful steam trains are going over the top of all their little dandy carts running up and down on the Hagalese's. Um, the Lands Viaduct was 640 feet long, 93 feet above the River Gornless, and it cost £15,422 to build, that's about £1.8 million in today's money, and in 1899, it was initially just a single track, um, but in 1899 the track over it was doubled, um, uh, which left us with this extraordinary picture of wonderful Victorian scaffolding. Um, the men are working at the top of all of this scaffolding, um, but they've just left room underneath there for the Hagaleses to squeeze through as the uh, big express line on the top is uh, doubled in size. The track is doubled. Now, in its heyday, six passenger trains a day in both directions ran across the viaduct. Far more important than the passenger trains, though, were the freight, freight trains, which carried County Durham Coke westward to the industries of Cumbria and returned eastwards carrying iron ore for the steelworks of South Durham and Teesside. These heavy mineral trains consisted of 36 20-ton wagons and between 1900 and 1918 half a million tons of minerals were transported across the Lands Viaduct and over the fell. Now this big era of industrialization of the railways was mirrored by what was going on in the coal industry on Cockfield Fell. The small bell pits died out and were replaced by one big industrial um, colliery, the Gordon House colliery, um, bits of which you can still see on the fell. It was sunk in 1893 and by the First World War and into the 1920s it was employing more than 800 men. This is big industrial work on the fell. But all of this is just a product of its time. Um, you can see the way the evolution of industry from the little dandy carts to the big railways to the uh, big coal mines. Um, but that evolution meant that its time was already running out. Um, Cockfield uh, Station closed in 1959. Uh, Gordon House Colliery closed in 1960. To the express line um, from Barney to Bishop Auckland closed in 1962, and the little old Hagaleses was finally pensioned off in 1963. And then demolition began in 1964. So that same scene looks like that with the top of the Lands Viaduct uh, removed. I think ever so poignantly um, they blew up um, uh, some of the legs of, of the uh, of the Lands Viaduct. Um, I always think it looks like um, a baby giant, you know, um, has been playing with his Lego. You know, whenever I get the good go at Lego, um, all I want to do is build a tower as tall as I possibly can. And I'm sure a baby giant was out there on the fell and he was building a big tower with his Lego. His mummy giant comes to him and says, come on, son, it's time to go to bed. And he said, oh, sod it. And he just 
knocked his tower and crashed it against the floor. And so it just lies there up the side of the fell. There it is coming down. And um, now the bits of a, of a giant's Lego just lie spread eagled up the side of the fell where they were blown up and they've just been allowed to rest. There we are. And um, so this is the way the uh, the heritage of the fell has been left, uh, just kind of lying there. Um, and now it is all so amazingly quiet. Um, no mines employing 800 mil men, no hundreds of bell pits, no um, steam engines, no horse drawn uh, wagons, no great clouds of dust and smoke, um, just the wind. So, so different from B's day, um, and particularly the way he took us on that epic, evocative journey when the air was thick and choky from the dust and the smoke from the mines, from the engines, and of course the beehive ovens that you can still see all the way uh, lining the bank side. Um, with B, we choked on the dust. We watched exploding engines soar over the roofs of the houses. Ah, there it goes. Um, we avoided the runaway self-propelling trains, both overground and underground. And we waved at the miners high on the hillsides, sitting in the mouth of their drifts with their black pipes in their black mouths. And we rode with the horses in the dandy carts. Now, all we are left with are just pits and pockmarks that are the legacy of the Hagalese's branch line. And I hope with B's help, we've managed to phrenologize some of the lumps and the bumps of the fell. So now I'm going to find out whether anyone is still awake and with me. I'm still here. Hey! <laughs> um, if anyone wants to put some questions on, right, here we go. Um, someone's asking, where is the lead smelting chimney located on your aerial map? Ah, uh, it's off. It's off to the left. Off to the left, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's uh, a technical term. <laughs> off the, yes, so um, can you still see my screen or have I managed to disable it? I think you've unshared, maybe. Uh, right, let me just get the right slide up. There was a mappy thing which is another technical term. Uh... So do type your questions on that chat pad and I will pose them to Chris. Uh, from the current slide. Um, no, that's not working. Um, share content. Let me see. Come on, share content button. Um, there we are. So, um, so can you see that? Oh, yeah. there goes my horse. Uh, and Copley chimney is just there. Um, so you have got the fell immediately off to the right hand side of my um, green circle. Uh, the slack you may be able to see. Um, that's at the foot of the fell, very near the skew bridge. Uh, and then Cockfield Fell is just there to the right. So um, the idea of the Copley smel uh, lead smelting um, mill was that it's kind of not quite equidistant, but um, it, the, uh, the iron ore came from Teesdale towards the fell. And so it's kind of built there on the just about on the edge of the uh, of the fell. OK. Thank you, <laughs> says questioner. Ah. Uh, perhaps we should bring Trish back in as well, because um, I know she uh, does a walk across the fell, um, which when we next run it, I'm sure people might like to. Here we go, sorry. Uh, There was a narrow gauge Sentinel loco that ran from Hollymoor Colliery down the fell. There's a picture in the Sentinel sales literature, but it also references an earlier loco. I haven't been able to find anything on this and it may be more sales pitch than history. Do you know anything about this? A narrow uh, gauge Sentinel loco? 
No. So is that? Um, I wonder if we're referring to um, uh, is that what I call the uh, little woodlands narrow gauge thingy? Um, um, let me see. I'm trying to find another mappy thing. Uh, that I think may have uh, referenced that. Um, so um, let me try and share yet again. There's lots of appreciation for your horse coming up on the ah, chat. Excellent, excellent. Um, I was pleased with my horse. Um, you can, I can share. Oh, why is that disappeared now? Um, I can share my my expenses claim with you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to do that. So where has that gone? Can you can you see that? No, not yet. No. You still can't. Nope. Uh, technology. Hide share options. Share content. Come on. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> More yeah. appreciation for the horse, I think, is needed. <laughs> um, why is that being awkward now? Why have I got so many things open on my screen? That might be part of the issue. Um, Oof. Oh, blimey. What's going on there? <laughs> We're all on the screen of your screen. Oh, right. Excellent. Don't know how you've done that. <laughs> Nor do I. It was all going so well. Um, so I was trying to show uh, that there was a little um, uh, branch line or a little line up to woodlands. And I wonder if okay. that's what the, uh, the gentleman is talking about. Yeah, because there's a car park up there. I think if it's yeah. the one there is, it's got a little tiny picnic site and a little tiny car park. So if you go up to Copley, which I highly recommend to people, um, you can also go there. And I think you can see where that little, there was a coal mine up there and things. Because it was, there, there is a tunnel under Woodlands, isn't there? Um, because the line went under, under the village, because the village is right on the, um, uh, right on the ridge. <clears throat> And there is still a blocked up tunnel where it goes underneath in a very narrow form. And no, there's, there's I've and never the, found that, never seen that. Yeah, the, the, the village is straggling along the ridge. Yeah. And um, there is uh, there is one house that is kind of missing. And mm. that is where the tunnel goes underneath. And they've never built oh. on top of the tunnel. It's kind of a bit like my teeth, really. There's a gap <laughs> where, where, where it's come out. Mm. Okay. All right, I'm just being asked if I'm going to post the, the video. Um, it'll probably be available, um, first of all, if you email. Um, and then afterwards, I think it's going to go up on the YouTube channel for the Stockton and Darlington. That's right, isn't it, Trish? Yeah, um, we've just started a YouTube channel uh, specifically for the festival, really. and. Um, that's going to have the recording of this talk and also I hope the talk on Thursday up on the channel but it won't be till at least the weekend because my husband's the technical one not me and he's away having a good time in Scotland at the moment but yeah it can be it'll be there. Yeah, I have to confess to having snipped a little bit of it because I was busy letting people in. So it may, I may just need to edit it slightly, but we've got another question coming in. Um, do you know how the stints were created? Oh, right. Well, um, uh, um, vaguely. Um, so <laughs> I, I think the stints are the, the long, narrow um fields uh, kind of paddocks and gardens behind the houses and um, they, they just follow the the frontage of the properties I, I think. Um, Trish are you going to tell me more? Well I was just going to say that I was reading a bit about this on Saturday because I was taking my walk on Sunday and um, apparently those particular tofts in Cockfield 
are quite special. They're quite unusual because they're much longer than the top yeah. normally are. So that may date back right back to medieval times when the village was first, if you like, developed. So um, and it, it'll have been to do with um, the way that people lived their lives in those days. You needed a piece of land close to the house. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, but they're very long. They're unusually long. And you all huddled, huddled around a village green for protection, usually from Scottish people. <laughs> Definitely from the Scottish people who turned up quite regularly. <laughs> um, we just got a little note from the uh, from a Scottish guest, person. No, from the guest <laughs> who was asking about the loco. It says the sentinel ran down the edge of Cockfield Fell, just to the east of the road. It's shown on the maps in 1924. But he's going to carry on doing research to see if he can uh, find out about a, an earlier loco. Right, excellent. Any more questions from anyone? It's gone quiet, yeah. but it does take a few minutes for people to type. If nothing comes in, then we might draw proceedings to a close around half eight. Did you have anything else, Chris? You want Trish? Chris? Trish? It's not very easy to say that name. Um, to add, Trish. Yeah. The only thing I was going to say is that um, hopefully we're going to do uh, a video of the walk on Cockfield Fell. And Chris has very kindly said he'll get involved in that because it's such a wonderful place. And if you are disabled or you have, you know, you have issues with mobility, um, it's not an easy place to get around. So we're going to try and put together a video so that people who can't get there can actually see it all because it is such a beautiful, interesting place. So watch this space because that will be going up on the Friends YouTube channel as well. And of course, as Chris was mentioning, he's back on Thursday at seven um, with the T-cell tracks and derailing dukes. So if anyone would like to come along to that, if you'd like to drop me an email to the Bishop Auckland has at durham.gov.uk, then uh, I can send out the registration details. It's amazing that talk should be under an hour but it looks like i've just looked at the time i think sitting down has slowed me down a lot and uh <laughs> you've you've got had an hour and 15 minutes an hour and 20 minutes i'm sorry i wasn't meant to go on that long at all and it really should be under an hour um another question just coming in on the other side of the fell what oh when they move up that does uh, on the other side of the fell what was the that railway line mainly used for is that my Woodlands one? They're, they're, they, they, which is, which I think is on the north side of the fell. If I could get my uh, technology to work, um, uh, and and they're all coal, they're all little coal lines. That, that that's the only point is to get, um, is to get, uh, um, is to get coal to the line, uh, to to the Hagalees, uh, so it can get off to uh, get off to market. Um, someone is asking, are there any photos of locomotives on the fell itself, not on the viaduct? Uh, I have never seen any of the, uh, the pictures I find are really, really hard to come by. Um, so, uh, no, uh, I, I haven't seen any of the uh, wagon ways or anything in operation, which is really disappointing because some of the um, aerial runways w were really exciting things to uh, be kind of like ski lifts going up and down the, uh, the the side of the fell, bringing great tubs of coal down the side, um, down to down to the Hagalese's branch line. Um, so it'd be great if uh, anyone has ever got any pictures like that. Um, yeah, because one of the things one of the things we're doing for the festival is the community museum aspect, and the idea of that is that we want people, anybody who's interested, um, and a lady I met on Sunday has gone home to do it because she was born in Cockfield, and her family was uh, has lots of photos and things, and we're trying to encourage people to look to see if they can find anything of interest related, obviously, to Bishop Auckland or to the Stockton and Darlington Railway. 
Um, and never know if people start looking, you know, maybe somebody somewhere will find a photo of of that kind of thing. You know, there probably are photos, but they're hidden away somewhere. So we want people to really look and see what they can find. Because there are all sorts of uh, interesting bits um, left kicking about um, because I was once shown um, just above the Langleydale viaduct on the, the great hill going down there. You can see um, two uh, large concrete bases uh, in the field, which were the footprints of, a, of, a, of an aerial runway of the pylons that used to go down to the uh, to to the the railway line there. So that all these bits and pieces are still there, and there's still quite, quite a lot of bricks and and things just lying about on the side of the fell. And you've got uh, all the way along the Hagleyses, you've got loads of um, uh, the uh, the coke ovens and the drift mines and things. It is a, it is a fascinating place, and uh, I love the mixture of nature and uh, and industry yeah. that is there yeah um well, can i just mention also that one of the things where the friends are going to be doing is we're going to be doing something we call the project walking the line and back in 2015 we walked as much of the stock the original stockton and darlington railway as we could um and then we produced seven walk booklets that people could use well very high on our list of priorities is to do exactly the same thing with the Hagalisa's branch line. And we'll be inviting people, volunteers, people who want to get involved to come along and help with that. And what we do is we record everything that we see, which is, if you like, of historic interest. Um, and when we did that with the Stockton and Darlington Railway itself, we discovered there was an awful lot left, a lot more left than people thought. <clears throat> so we'll be calling for volunteers to get invo involved in that when we do the Hagadises branch line, and that will probably be sometime next year. Um, just to go back to our line and where it headed, um, our guest is saying, I know it it headed to it headed to Barna Castle. So this is the um... other side of the fell. What was the railway line mainly used for? So we're saying. Their understanding was it, it went off to Barna Castle. And uh, no, I'm not in touch with Gary Marshall. <laughs> um, so he's got some <coughs> photos. Well, anything is interesting, yeah. yeah. I can probably uh, track down Gary for you. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Thank you. Oh, good treasure. Right. So yes, it's probably a bit difficult remotely to uh, work out this uh, railway line issue. <laughs> yeah, and need to need to get a map up and uh, yeah. do it properly. Yeah. Okay, we're sort of around half past eight. I put a call out for final questions. Um, so <coughs> we're probably. At an end, it's probably cocoa time. <laughs> time. <laughs> well, can I just say on behalf of everybody, Chris, I've thoroughly enjoyed listening to you and I've learned a few things I didn't know. And I do love your horses very much indeed. So I'm <laughs> sure on behalf of everybody um, to say thank you to you, you know, and we really appreciate it. And, um, you know, being able to do things virtually, it's not easy. But um, I'm delighted and thank you for actually doing it. OK, pleasure. Yeah, uh, I would echo that. Thank you very much. And thanks for your support for the festival again this year. And um, hopefully yeah, we'll see you Thursday along with maybe some of the guests we've uh, heard from tonight. I know there's a couple of people saying see you Thursday. All right, great. <laughs> so there's definitely some uh, some double stints going on. Uh, they'll be back for more. Um, and you can see there's messages coming in. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> so I'll uh, formally bring the event to a close. Um, if anyone wants to sort of leave a message on the pad, we'll stay on a little bit longer. Um, we'll just pick those up. But otherwise, if you want to leave the meeting uh, via the hang up red button on the end, um, we'll hope to see some of you back on Thursday and thanks very much for coming along.
Thank you very much. Good night. Good night. There we go. Thanks very much. That was you. Very good, Chris. Cheers. Thanks. Cheers. Bye. 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 A few people just typing messages. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and Chris, I looked up that one about the st the tofts. Yeah. And one of the theories is that cockfields are so long because it may be that they created the normal toft with a single strip right. from what in those days was a field and so by amalgamating the two they gave them very large long tofts right it's a really good book landscapes document documents and maps villages in northern england and beyond ad 900 to 1250 right <laughs> it's a good book actually Okay, I'm just going to stop the recording now. All right.